testimony, is it not? So good to see you this morning. It's good to be back from Central America. I wasn't here last week. Heard you had great services. Uh, trying to fly back on that particular day, getting out of Belize and back here. We went down there for two basic reasons. One was to set up and finalize the preparation work for our crusade in Belize, Central America. The other was for this conference, the Equip 2014 conference that we do every year. Been doing it now. I believe this was our 10th year to do the pastors' conferences for the pastors in Belize. Amen. Part of your Christmas offering goes to that, to set that conference up and bring those pastors in. It's always exciting to get them there. Uh, I asked a couple of them how they got there. One guy told me he rode a bus uh, almost eight hours uh, riding a bus. Now, this is not like the Greyhound you're going to get from here to Dallas or somewhere. Right? <laughs> Please understand. You, you've seen the movies with the chickens on the top and all that. Yeah, those buses. That was the buses, you know, with no air conditioning. And uh, just to get there, to make that kind of commitment to come. Others hitchhiked, others rode with others and found rides. But... Uh, they look forward every year to this, to this conference as it's grown each year and uh, the way it's put together. This year we added uh, a unique twist to it all. We added an extra day. Uh, they asked us the last several years, the, the big complaint, the only complaint's been, it's not long enough. We need it to be a little longer. And so I've been working with some other churches to see if they wanted to foot the bill for the extra day because our church covers all the cost of the conference and setting it up, materials, the, the Bible study, the, the schedules, everything is presented by our church. We provide them workbooks. Uh, we even give them a stipend of uh, 60 Belize dollars, which is 30 U.S. dollars. That $30 is basically a, a day's wages for most of these guys to help them. Most of them have to take a day off to come to the conference and then they have travel expenses as well. So remember this is a third world country. Most of the pastors are bivocational. They have they pastor as one of the jobs and then they have a secular job to help pay the bills. So it's a way that our church helps them to get there and cover some of the costs that they may lose in taking a day off to be at the conference. But the, the idea was to add the extra day. Uh, church out of Louisiana and James Darby, many of you know James, he's been here in different events we've, we've hosted before. His church in Stafford and the church out of Louisiana, they partnered together uh, and said, we'll, we'll take the, the, the extra day's cost. And those pastors came down, were a part of the, the conference. It was a great, great time in the Lord. Uh, we, we, when we get there, we have about four or five sessions. We have everybody in the same room and we use a translator. Uh, for the individual teaching schedule, we, uh, we have a little different layout. We put the pastors of, and the English-speaking pastors in one location at the resort, and we take the uh, Spanish-speaking to another location, and we teach them there with translators. So uh, it's the, we get a little more time with them. We can answer more specific questions for the, for the uh, Spanish-speaking pastors and be a little more specific with the English-speaking pastors. Uh, but it's, it's, always a, it's always a fascinating time to hear where they're at, what God's doing in Belize itself, and what kind of ministry that God has given us to them there. In fact, I have just a little short clip. I uh, had Kathy shoot for me real quick as we close the conference. We close it with like we're going to do today with, with the Lord's Supper, uh, with communion time. Uh, it, was, it was a really moving communion service. There's one couple, an American couple, that's been in Belize for 50 years as missionaries. And it was their last time to be with all the pastors. So it was a real, you know, everybody's got tissues and tears and crying. And uh, he, he, he and his wife, his most precious people, N.T. Dillinger, his wife's name's Joy. And, uh, you know, their plans is that our plans were to die in Belize. But he came down with a, a certain type of cancer he has to have a lot of different treatments for. And he said, we just can't afford to go back and forth. So we're going to move home uh, back to Alabama for these last days, but the, he was very heartbroken. So we had this big communion service and great time with the Lord. And uh, afterwards, the communion service was over. I just grabbed Ruperto Vincenti, who is the president of the Conference of Baptists there in Belize, and had him just share a brief word. So here's a word to you if you got volume on it. Of the Baptist Conference, the Baptist Association of Belize. Uh, the guy that works with us down here and makes all that we do with our conferences possible. I want him just to kind of share a bit with you, maybe a minute here, just about what the conference means to the pastors in Belize. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Joe, and thank you, um, Believers Fellowship Church, for allowing Pastor uh, Arms to be with us here in Belize and to invest in our pastors. And I want to thank you, the church, for allowing this to happen. And certainly, we are truly blessed, and we are better equipped for our service here in Belize. And so our church will grow as a result of your investment. 
in our ministry here in Belize. Thank you very much for your investment. Thank you for blessing us, and thank you for God's blessing. Amen. God bless. Thank you. God bless. Appreciate you, brother. In case you didn't understand his South Texas dialect, uh, he was thanking you very much for the investment that the church has made and uh, uh, believes that God is continuing to use it to grow the churches there. So we'll continue to do that ministry as, as long as the Lord gives us wisdom and the grace to do so. Amen. But I want you just to, to know that how much they appreciate you and how much they, they love you. Uh, the second thing that we did while we were in Belize was to work, as I said, with the Belmopan pastors. Uh, probably next Sunday or so, I'll be bringing, uh, handing out some cards that just has, has just two words, pray, or three words, pray for Belize on them. And uh, on that card, and we may even put on the back of the card everybody that's going on it and pass those out to you as prayer reminders to start praying now. Maybe put it on your table or your refrigerator or somewhere to remind you daily to start praying for that crusade in Belmapan and to lift up the people that are they're going as well. That, that trip departs here, what, June 13th? I think we're, we're heading out. And so uh, in Belmapan is a city that we've never done any crusades in. We've done youth rallies there before, but never gone in for a crusade. So uh, it's, it's new territory. It's also the capital, all right? So it'll be interesting to, to see what the Lord does there. We're excited about it, and the churches seem to be excited today. But today, and coming back, and I think this is a really good time to share in the Lord's Supper as we just follow up Easter. And, and you, you know, if, uh, if you're familiar with Believer's Fellowship and you're a member here regularly, when we don't do... When we do communion, we don't tack it on kind of to a service. It is the service. So today, this is the service as we share in the Lord's Supper. And since it is the service, there are some things that I, I want to share with you about this time. But it's a great time for us to come together. In fact, it's probably about the fourth time in the last couple of weeks I've had the Lord's Supper. We did it at our men's retreat, and we followed up in Belize, and we've done it in other places, and, and again, this, at the other campus. But uh, Jesus said, as often as you do this, been quite often for me here lately, but as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So I, I want you to just take a moment right now, put it in park, all right? <laughs> take a deep breath, get everything out of your heart and mind, it's not about Jesus. Now, I know it may be a difficult week, you may have some difficult things going on in your life, you may be ready to string your kids up by their heels, you may be ready to shoot your wife or husband, I don't know, you, or your boss or whatever it might be. Maybe there's a lot going on in your life. Maybe just a lot of business is happening. But whatever it is, good, bad, in between, indifferent, put it all aside. Just put it all, when Jesus said, remember me, the idea had to do with an absolute focus. Get everything else in your mind. And let's think about the Lord this morning. And let's think about everything that he's done for us. And let's just, let's just concentrate on, on his word to us and, 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 and the word that he has for our lives. Our scripture we'll look at is one we often share when we come to this, this time of sharing in the Lord's Supper. And it's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll begin with verse 23. All right? Chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You might want to underline that. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He goes on to say at this point, in the same way, he took the cup and after the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There it is again. We're remembering Christ and all he's done for us. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If I get past the scripture here, you stay up with me if you don't mind there at the back for just a moment. You proclaim the Lord's death. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Verse 31. Are you keeping up with me back there? <laughs> but if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you're hungry, then let him eat at home, so you'll not be come together for judgment. The remaining matters I'll arrange when I come. 
The whole idea here is, 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 is that in the context of the Lord's Supper, it is a meal of remembrance. It is a memorial time. And memory has everything to do with it. And remembering what we know and bringing into full cognizant clarity before us, Jesus. You know, however your mind works in that regard, however it works in the context of pictures or thoughts or what God's done in your life as a result of that, just let God do something this morning in your life. Just open your heart and your mind to whatever he might say to you. He talks about the importance of mem remembering and I think the importance of how we remember when he says this issue about taking it worthily. Remember that's an adverb. It's not an adjective. It's not describing you. It's describing how you do it. Because there's not too many of us in this room who actually feel like we're worthy. Right? We're not because of all of sin. But he's not talking about us as individuals in, in regard to our value or worth. He's talking about in the manner in which we were received the Lord's Supper. It's an adverb. It describes the verb of taking the Lord's Supper. You do it the right way, with the right heart, in the right frame of mind, with the right, with the right attitude, that you have, you're putting everything else aside and you're, you're focusing on all that God is and done for you through his son, Jesus Christ. He says, we just, you know, we, we should judge our body correctly. Now, remember when Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he's writing to a church that had a lot of issues. This is, a, and, and like any brand new church that's filled with a lot of people, you've got a lot of immature people. Some have been saved for some time and have not been growing, proper, growing in the Lord correctly. They're not maturing in Christ. And so they're, 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 they're dwarfed in their spiritual life. If you remember the first letter, he's rebuking them for that and telling them, hey, it's time to get to the deeper things. And it's more than just milk. There's meat to take. And so he's dealing with issues in the church from their immaturity to spiritual gifts to divorce and remarriage. Talks about a lot of stuff in this letter. But he kind of hits the brakes here for a moment and he talks, that, talks to them about the way they were receiving the Lord's Supper. He said, hey, you come together for this meal, which you ought to do. The Lord tells us to do this, all right? He said, but in the way you're doing, it's not right. Your heart's not right. Your life's not right. And he makes this point about we should be discerning. We should examine ourselves. He uses the word, we should judge ourselves correctly. Now, the word judgment here is unique because it has to deal with the, the idea of weighing things out and making the right decision and looking at things the way they really are. And what he wants us to do here is to bring ourselves into that place. It's one thing for us to look around the room and make some judgments, all right? If you're here for the first time today, you've probably already made some judgments, you know. You know, look at that guy over there. He's a bit strange, you know, or whatever it might be, you know. What's that pastor, you know, where's his tie, that kind of stuff, those judgments <laughs> that people make, you know. We have all these things, but he, he's telling us, to, back off that for a minute here. Let's look at ourselves. Where are we? Where's our relationship with God? And he talks about this, this all-important issue of having sin within our life. He said, because if you approach the table with, with, with things that God's dealt with you about in your life and you're not dealing with it and you're not getting rid of it, you're not turning from it, and you're not making decisive actions in your life, he said, boy, you're taking it in that bad manner. That's, that's not the worthily way to take it, all right? If you're going to take it worthily, it means your heart's right. Remember, everything represented with, with the blood and the, the, and, and the bread, the, the juice and the bread, it, it represents, again, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why was the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ presented? Well, John put it this way. He was manifested that he might take away our sins. So, in other words, the message here is, is redemption. The message is deliverance from sin. The message is Jesus, who knew no sin, becomes our sin so that we can... Remember an, an event? No. So that we can be set free from our sins, all right? That's, that's the message that emanates from the table of the Lord this morning. We can be free. Now, Jesus paid the great price for that. So Paul is dealing with this issue, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit, he's saying, hey, don't come to this table with willful disobedience in your life when Jesus paid everything that needs to be paid for you to be free. Don't, don't you agree that's pretty much the, the theme of what he's trying to say here? If this represents deliverance, then what are we still doing with our sin? What are we, why are we holding on to things? Why, why are we holding on to relationships that are not right and bitterness in our heart or things that we're doing? I mean, sin comes in all kinds of forms from the things that we would do or the things that we should be doing that we're not doing versus attitudes, sins of the heart that nobody ever sees, you know, outward sins that others do see. Whatever it is, I mean, we, 
the price has been paid for us to be free in Christ Jesus. And this is the message in physical form that's before us that declares our freedom in Christ. So he says, discern where your heart's at. In fact, there's three real quick points. Let me just get to the, the, the central verse is this, that as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. All right? It's the message of the cross of Jesus, which is the message of hope, the message of salvation, the message of deliverance, the message of hope to come, the hope for eternity. It's all represented here, the Lord Jesus. But there's three distinct ways, I think, that we, we look at it today. First of all, the first significant fact has to do with the past. And remembering me, it's commemoration. He said, you do show the Lord's death. All right. This is the picture of the Lord's death. His body was given for us. His blood was shed for us. You do show the Lord's death. So if anything really ought to be on our heart and mind today, it's remembrance of what happened 2,000 years ago, plus years ago, when Jesus Christ shed his blood for us to deliver us and set us free. Now, we see this in the, the, uh, the prophetic symbol and the prophetic picture of the Old Testament was the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, right? That was all a prophetic picture that, that one, it makes a very clear statement, sin has a price. Something, something dies. Wages of sin is death. In the garden, it was an innocent animal. In the sacrifices for men's sin, at the Passover, whenever, it, was, it was an innocent animal, without blemish, without spot. Jesus comes, John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we have this, we have this picture very clearly put before us of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I, I don't know how many, I'm sure that in heaven I could get an accurate count from the, from the, the data department. You know, of how many blood, of how much blood was spilled, how many lambs, how many bulls, how many goats, how many doves, turtle doves, how, how many animals were killed. But if you took all the blood from all those animals, all together, it still will not cover one individual sin. It won't pay for one person's sin. It all pointed to this, the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Paul wrote in Hebrews, I believe Paul, or whoever you may think wrote it, the writer of Hebrews has said, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. But the blood of Jesus takes away our sin. So as we receive this, let's look back and let's remember our precious Savior dying on the cross for our sins. The second thing it points to is, has to do with the, the present and communion. As often as you do this, you're remembering, you're fellowshipping. Obviously, first and foremost, it's our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a meal that commemorates the fact that you and I now get to know God. We get to know Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living in us because of what Christ has done for us. We know him. We walk with him. Amen. He's in us. We have a new life. We have a new walk. I, I have fellowship with God. First John, John writes there, he says, you know, uh, the reason we're writing to you, you know, is so you can know you have this life. He said, we, we've handled the word of life. We, we've tasted, we've seen, and we're telling you these things so that you might have fellowship with us. What's the, the, the message of the gospel? You can walk with God, you can fellowship with God, you can have communion with God. This is just a physical representation of the life that you can experience in fellowship with God. But not just fellowship with God, I believe this is, he, he's dealing with the church at Corinth about the, the issue of their, their individual fellowship with each other as well. Their heart with God needs to be right to take that honorably before the Lord. But then the relationship he deals with very clearly throughout Corinthians is their relationship to each other. The importance of loving one another, receiving one another, caring for one another, committed to one another, lifting up one another, you know, standing there for one another. It's the, it's, it's the fellowship we experience. Now, let's say Jesus didn't die. Let's say we haven't got to that place in history yet. Do you believe um, there's any way in the world that all of us would know each other? Some of you let me know, I don't think I'd ever fellowship with you. <laughs> it's just, look around, there's so much diversity at Believer's Fellowship, it's incredible. You know, from, from racial to economic, there's just tons of diversity in our church. Uh, it's a little sample of heaven, all right? So if you're looking for a church, come join heaven, all right? <laughs> just a little, just all unique backgrounds, all unique walks, all kinds of unique people. God, he's the only one that can give that kind of fellowship. 
That, that there's the love and the unity and the commitment that this fellowship has is so unique. One thing over and over as I talk to people uh, that come to Believer's Fellowship, man, this, this, I've, I've never been in church like this. I just never, I just never been in a place like this, you know, where there's this kind of commitment that people have to one another and love for one another. But where does that come from? It comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the, the present fact of our communion with him and then our fellowship together around him and around the cross with each other. It speaks of the present, but it also speaks of the future. This, uh, this instrument right here, as Paul is writing to us in the scripture, he says, you know, you do this as often as you do in verse 26. You proclaim the Lord's death until, you may know the next two words, he comes. In fact, Jesus himself made reference to the future in the upper room with the disciples when he says, I'm not going to do this with you again until we do the Father's kingdom. He pointed to the future. There's going to be a day when we're going to sit down and receive the Lord's Supper with each other and with Jesus. Physically. He's going to be in the room. Amen. Now he's here in the room in our midst. He's promised us that. But I mean physically, tangibly, you're going to be able to reach out and touch the hand of Jesus. He's going to be able to reach out and touch the cheek on your face. I mean, that's the day we look forward to. I believe with all my heart Excuse me if you think I'm a little mildly insane. You wouldn't be the first. I believe with all my heart, Jesus Christ is coming again. Maybe you didn't hear that. I believe with all my heart, he's coming again. And not only do I believe that he's coming, I, be, I don't believe that's a, a, you know, a metaphor. The angel, when Jesus departed, turned to the disciples and says, This same Jesus will come again like manner. Not another one, not a representative, not an ambassador, all right? Not no one else, but this same Jesus. This same Jesus we're going to sit down with in the kingdom of heaven, wherever that great banquet hall of heaven is, we're going to sit there, meet with him, and we're going to take this together, and we're going to remember. Can you imagine what a worship service that's going to be? Yes. Boy, for all you folks that haven't learned how to worship yet, you're going to be a little awkward feeling here. <laughs> what a great moment in time. I mean, forgive me. Well, don't forgive me. I don't care if you're not. I get excited about it. I really do. I, I think we're so close. There's the, just look at the globe. Look what's happening in Russia. Look what's happening in the Middle East. Look what's happening in Europe. Look what's happening in America. Look, what, look at all the calamity globally. Look at the, ec the economic policies of the world. The, uh, I mean, it's just the stage is set. The stage is set. And any moment we could be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. I believe that with all my heart. And I, 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 I believe it so much I, I look up occasionally. <laughs> How about you? Hey, this represents the fact that there's going to be this future event. We will receive it with the Lord. It, 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 but it speaks first and foremost of, you know, uh, of this commitment to the future that he's made with us. But it's this com commitment in, in reality to everything about us. It, he which began a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What a great promise. He's going to, he, he, which, he which began this work is going to finish it. If we've been justified by faith, the Bible says we're being sanctified and we're going to be glorified. And just as he has this glorified physical body, we're going to stand with him with these glorified physical bodies and we're going to enjoy the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ forever because of what this represents here. Bread, the wine, the juice, the wine, that's all, the blood of the grapes is called, the bread and the juice. By the way, you know, these kind of things, they spoil easily. Even unleavened bread eventually spoils. It's temporary. It's, it's, but it represented the frail, temporary, physical body that we possess and that Jesus came and clothed himself in and became a man. And he gave himself on the cross and being a frail temporary body it feels every part of a crucifixion it feels pain and the agony but it speaks to the lord jesus and his commitment to you and his commitment to me so in just a moment we're going to receive the lord's supper together but i think it's fitting and appropriate that we just stand with our heads bowed in this moment and just some music coming in the background 
I want to give you an opportunity today to judge the body correctly, as the apostle tells us in Scripture in 1 Corinthians, just to look at our own heart, to examine ourselves, to see where we are in our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to just come to the altar this morning for a moment and kneel here and pray, or if you want to just kneel at your seat, if you want to pray with somebody, you come. If you want us to pray for you, we'll have some men here in the altar place. We'll be glad to pray for you this morning. But we'll meet you here. But let's just take a couple of minutes here. And let's just do some business, some worship business with God, some eternal business with God. If there's anything that you know that's in your heart and your life that would hinder you from taking the Lord's Supper worthily, let's just ask God to wash us and cleanse us and forgive us. God's grace is so present in this room, right in this moment. Some people say, well, Brother Joe, I'm not going to take the Lord's Supper. My heart's tired. Get your heart right. All you have to do is confess your sins. Turn to the Lord. Turn from yourself. God is faithful and just to forgive us today, the Bible says. So don't, don't approach it with that mindset. I think some people say that because they think that they have to go out and try harder first. Prove something to God. No, folks, it's all grace. You can't prove anything. It's all grace. Maybe this moment, just let the grace of God touch your heart and fill your life. As we worship, just take some time to, to do what the Lord would have us do in this moment. You come. We'll pray with you if you'd like. precious blood of Jesus Christ. The ransom, the price paid for our sins. And I pray that as we approach this table and receive these elements that you help us, Holy Spirit, to be focused on that one who's above all things, whose name is above all things. 
the Lord Jesus, your son. Amen. You may be seated. We have some gentlemen that are going to come and help us at this time. In just a moment, we'll pass these elements out among you. And as we do so, you'll take them and hold them just for a moment. We'll share these parts together. Jesus began with the bread as he took it. They finished the Passover meal and he took the unleavened bread and he broke it. He passed that among the disciples. Remember, this is a covenant meal. It's a promise God is making to forgive, to cleanse, to receive you. You become adopted into his family, sealed with the precious blood of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Gave it all. So as you take this bread today, as we pass it among you, just remain in a prayerful attitude. And then we will say a word of thanksgiving and prayer together. And as we do that, then we'll take and we'll, we will eat together as well. You gentlemen, pass it out. body of the Lord Jesus Christ, pierced, bruised, wounded for our sin, for my sin, for your sin. What an offering that he gave himself. What an offering, but it was a complete offering. It was substantially everything that needed to happen for you and I to know God. For by one man's sin, death entered into the world. By one man's disobedience, we all became sinners. But by one man's obedience, the man God, the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be made right with God. Just bow your head for a moment and tell the Lord thank you. The Bible says that he took that bread and he gave thanks. We want to take a moment before we receive it just to give thanks. He gave thanks, knowing what was ahead of him, knowing what was about to befall that very evening, 
knowing of the punishment, the torture, the pain, the cross to come, he gave thanks. Knowing what would come from that sacrifice, you, I, in this moment, worshiping him in fellowship with him. How can we ever say thank you enough, Lord Jesus? How can we ever honor you enough? You are so worthy. We just want to say right here before you, thank you. We love you. Thank you for the life, the forgiveness, the deliverance that is ours in your son Jesus' name. Thank you. Would you eat the bread in remembrance of Christ today? manner did you ever stop and ask yourself when it says that in like manner he took the cup they passed his cup out among you I believe that manner was a manner of humility obedience submissiveness to the father's will let's have the same manner in receiving it today tell us that when Jesus took the cup and said this is the cup of the new covenant it's testimony in his blood sealing the relationship that you and I can have with God the Father you look in that little cup this morning it's filled with grape juice all right it's not wine we don't use literal wine in the church because I don't think it's representative of the blood of Jesus it's gone through fermentation which basically means spoiled 
The last thing Jesus' blood was spoiled. In fact, the word translated sometimes wine is the word great Jews, in English language. It's a word which literally means, well, Genesis, but it's the blood of the grape. In other words, somebody took a grape and crushed it. And out of that crushing came this juice. The grape represented the fruit of the vine, life. You look at the fruit that comes off trees, flowers that bloom off plants, they represent life. The blood of Jesus is our life. And he was crushed for our sins that we might experience that life. And it says that he gave thanks again. Let's give him thanks. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. How can words ever express our gratitude again? Especially as we pause to remember what you experienced for us. It's not a fairy tale. It's not some story mythologically placed in some book. Some Greek god or something. This is reality. This is you loving us so much. Thank you for loving us. Forgive us if we ever doubt the fact that you're loving us. You demonstrate it clearly. We have this clear picture before us. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you take and drink, which is Christ. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Praise the Lord. I'm glad you came too. What a great time it always is when we take time to share in the Lord's Supper and share in communion together. I'm so glad that you were here to be a part of it. Uh, number one is Don Arbach. Or, or just wave your hand, Don, real quick. Don is stepping out of our nursery director coordinator's job over there. She's done a fantastic job. I'll give her a praise the Lord. And Erica, in a moment of madness, has volunteered. <laughs> Y'all raise your hand, Erica. Wave and everybody say, you're looking to, to help a children's ministry, you know, get a hold of these people. Also, Matthew Campbell's done a great job in, uh, of working with our children. We didn't really make much of an announcement about that. But you let Matt know when you see him. He's taking over that children's church and children's coordinator as well in that, that part of the church. Let him know how much you appreciate him and love him. Appreciate what, what, what you, these people are doing for our kids. Most of all, importantly, more than pat them on the back, help them out. There's always a place that you can serve, even in rotation every six or eight weeks or something. Get with them and say, hey, I want to help. I, I want to be a part of that. You know, I'm not asking you to move in there full time, okay? But you can, you can help. We always expect those who have children in those areas to help us and as an expectation to get on a rotation. But everybody, you know, 
You say, well, I don't have kids anymore. Good, your experience will use you. <laughs> You've been there, done that, amen? So be sure and let, let everybody know that you appreciate their, all they do for the Lord in these different areas of ministry. Praise God. A couple things just to remind you briefly, don't forget your tithes and your offerings.